Amen. Let us pray and ask the Lord for eyes of faith to see and understand and to hear his word together. Our Father, our God, our great King and Savior, Holy Spirit, we ask of you that you will minister to us today through your word. King Jesus, as you rule us and govern us by means of your word, by means of your spirit, will you be gentle with us? Correct us where we have have fallen and erred and sinned against you. Redeem us from the sin that remains. Cleanse us from the sin that remains. Holy Spirit, will you give to us the gift of understanding your word, of being able to to be convicted rightly uh, where sin remains, to be able to have the gift of believing by faith the great promises that you've given to us of a king who cleanses and pardons sin, who deals gently and tenderly with his people. Father, will you show us your kindness today as we open your word together. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So take your seat with me and turn uh, to Judges chapter 17. We began a new section today in Judges. We, we've worked through the last several months the, the Judges proper. You know, from chapters 3 through 16, we've looked at the individual Judges. And we've, we've spent the last four weeks looking at Samson, who, of course, is a quite the colorful character. But Judges 17 to 21... 17 through the end of the book marks a new section. And, and as you, you may remember, if you go all the way back to the beginning, as we did uh, a couple of introductory messages on the book of Judges, one of the things that we, we looked at is that Judges is not written in a strictly chronological sense. So when we come to chapter 17, for example, we're going to be introduced to a man named Micah. We ought not to think of this as necessarily happening immediately after Samson, or necessarily after Samson at all. This is a change of scene. And so what we've, taken, what we've looked at in chapters 3 through 16 is really the question, what's going on at the national level within Israel? And we've seen various tribes, and we've seen what's happened, for example, with Samson over the last four weeks, and we might be tempted at that point to think, well, the real problems in Israel were because of their leaders, The real problem that existed in Israel was the deficiency of the moral character of their leaders. Well, certainly we can make the argument with all of the judges they were flawed, whether it was Samson or Jephthah or Othniel or or Barak or Gideon, all of them, we we pointed out the, the narrator of Judges is honest with us about their flaws all the way through. But what we find out beginning in chapter 17 17 and 18 kind of go together, and then chapters 19, 20, and 21 will form another unit. And what we find in these last two remaining units is the problem wasn't actually a leadership issue after all. The rot and the decay, the depravity that was found at the top, so to speak, really begins at the bottom. It begins where you and I sit today. It begins in the ordinary worship of ordinary people. It begins with this statement here that every man did what was right in his own eyes. Not just that a king did or a governor did or a judge did and the people followed after. In fact, one commentator, I think, uh, with a great deal of insight, says, you know, when this, we read this statement, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. He wasn't arguing in favor of a monarchy to solve the problem. What he was saying is, these people didn't need a king to lead them into sin. They could find sin very well on their own. And by focusing here on the tribes in 17 and 18, we're going to focus on the tribe of Dan. And then in 19, 20, and 21, we're going to focus on the tribe of Benjamin. Now, why is that significant? Because the narrator is showing us, if you turn to the back of your Bible and look at your map, Dan and Benjamin are dead center in the promised land. What he's communicating to us is the problems that we're going to observe in chapter 17 with Micah and this illegitimate Levitical priest and his own household idols and all these kinds of things. This wasn't some isolated event that took place with maybe some you know, really questionable characters who lived on the east side of the Jordan, for example. 
or on the fringes of Israelite society. No, this was the heart and core of Israel was polluted to the very middle. The title of today's sermon is The Anarchy of Self-Derived Worship. That's kind of a mouthful. But anarchy, you know what this is. This is just lawlessness. This is every man ruling himself, and no one's in charge, and everyone's in charge. And the idea of self-derived worship, this is the idea that says that, that, that a man, we'll see Micah today, who says, you know, I will worship God on my terms, by the means that I like, in the place of my own choosing, with the instruments of my own hands. And, and what the... What, the Holy Spirit is showing to us through the human author that we don't know his name, the book of Judges, is that the real problem in Israel didn't start with Samson. It didn't start with Gideon. It didn't start with Barak or Deborah or Othniel. It started around the hearth of ordinary homes. It started in the hearts of ordinary people. It started with the faithlessness of every man of every woman, and from the bottom rot, it went to the top. That's really the message that we're going to see as the book concludes. Now, if you're like me, you may be looking at the last few chapters of Judges and thinking, well, why can't we just kind of close the book at Samson and move on to something more uplifting? Because we're going to, the, the, the writer here sort of makes us wallow a little bit in the depravity of Israel. It's uncomfortable. We're going, to, we're going to read about some things that we, you may even have the impression about. Why is this even in the Bible? This is, this is horrible. Well, yes, and it's designed by the Holy Spirit to be shocking to us. Because the whole message is that this is where worship that's self-derived and self-centered, man-centered, this is where it inevitably takes you. That's the lesson of the final chapters of Judges. So today we have a short chapter. It's just 13 verses. Uh, Micah and an unnamed Levite and an unnamed mother. The anarchy of self-derived worship. And I'm going I'm to divide this in three, three sections, three points. First is the anatomy of self-derived worship. What does this look like? What are the component parts? What, how do we recognize something that is man-centered and self-derived? And secondly, the self-deception of self-derived worship. Self-derived worship is, is inevitably deceiving, both to the one who practices it and to those who are exposed to it. We're going to look at, the, the, there's a deception here that pervades the text. And lastly, what's the remedy? What's the remedy for self-derived worship? So let's read the, together the text. Again, it's a short chapter. I'll read the entirety of it here. Hear the word of God, and and may the Lord give us grace to receive this, not as just a sermon or just the words of a man, but truly as it really is, the word of God. There was a man of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, The 1,100 pieces of silver that were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse, and also spoke it in my ears, behold, the silver's with me, I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be my son by the Lord. And he restored the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, I dedicate to the Lord from my hand for my son to make a carved image and a metal image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith who made it into a carved image and metal image. And it was in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod and household gods, and ordained one of his sons who became his priest. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now, there was a young man of Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite. And he sojourned there, and the man departed from the town of Bethlehem in Judah to sojourn where he could find a place. And as he journeyed, he came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah. And Micah said to him, where do you come from? And he said, I am a Levite of Bethlehem in Judah, and I am going to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said to him, stay with me and be to me a father 
and the priests, and I will give you ten pieces of silver a year and a suit of clothes and your living. And the Levite went in, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became to him like one of his sons. And Micah ordained the Levite, and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as a priest. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's think together about the anatomy of self-derived worship. What does this look like? If we have a worship that is inherently self-centered, man-centered, what are, the, what are the symptoms? What are the identifying characteristics? What are the features of this? Notice for the, in the first place, I'm going to give you three. There, there are probably others as well, but I'm going to give you three that, that are prominent in the text. One is a disregard for God's law, God's law and holiness. The first feature of, of this self-derived religion is a disregard for holiness. It, it's a show of religion. And, and just notice very briefly what's happening here. We see, first of all, here's a man who has stolen a large sum of money. 1,100 pieces of silver is a large sum of money. He's stolen it, he's stolen it from his own mother. We have an Eighth Commandment issue right, right off the bat. He stole. And a Fifth Commandment issue. He stole from his own mama, his own mother. So it's a dishonoring of his mother. We see him, him confessing this. He's, okay, Mom, I'm the one who took it. But it wasn't out of repentance. Why why did he confess this? Because he had overheard her utter a curse on whoever stole it. And he thought, well, I don't want the curse on me, so I better come clean and give this back. He was motivated out of fear and self-preservation, not holiness. And then his mother responds by invoking Yahweh's name, which is, is, is good, except that she invokes his name in the context of commissioning an artist to create an idol. And you'll see in the the text, it's not two different things. It says a metal image, or a, a, a carved image and a metal image. Those aren't two different things. It would have been wood or stone carved and then coated with the metal. So it is both a carved and a metal image. It would have been coated over, either dipped or poured, plated with, this in this case, silver. Then we also see that Micah had already, by this point, possessed a house of gods. The text tells us he had a shrine. It literally means a house of gods. The the word that's often translated for God proper, Elohim, in this case, it's plural, and it's just an ordinary common gods. He had a shrine to household idols already in his possession. So there's a disregard for God's law. This is what pervades, this is the context for the whole setting, the whole story, is that these are people who confess the name of Yahweh. But there's no no urgency in pursuing Yahweh. There's no sense of holiness. There's no sense of desire to be conformed to his image. And even we see other evidence. The the mother, upon receiving back the 1,100 pieces of silver, she asks the Lord, basically, will you bless my son instead of cursing? She's trying to reverse the curse, in a sense. But even then... What happened to the other 900 shekels of silver? She said, I devote all of it to the Yahweh. Then she gives 200 for this image to be made. Where's the other 900? So there's a, there's a number of pieces of evidence that don't add up. Now, the Apostle Paul would later make the same connection here. He says the correct response to our receiving of God's infinite mercy is to, see, is to seek to walk before him in holiness, in righteousness. He says in Romans chapter 12, He spent the first 11 chapters laying out the glories of the gospel, initiated the mind of God in eternity, brought forth in time, and now he comes to chapter 12, he says, Therefore, my brothers, I appeal to you by the mercies of God, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. This is your reasonable response. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Our worship can never be considered genuine, never be considered authentic. This is not actual Yahweh worship if we're not actively pursuing holiness. 
if, if we're not actively fleeing from the idolatry that remains in us, if we're not actively seeking by the Spirit's power and strength to mortify sin that remains, can it ever be considered genuine worship? There was a, there was a flagrancy, a deliberateness to the sin that, that Micah and his mother, and we're going to see even the Levite, would practice. So that's the first characteristic we see. If we're going to think about the anatomy, think about if we were going to have some sort of visual representation, which would be an irony, wouldn't it? If we were going to have some sort of visual representation of what this, this creature, this, this self-derived worshiper looks like, the first characteristic we're going to see is a complete disregard for God's law, for his holiness. Secondly, it's a disregard for God's prescribed means of worship. See, what we can easily be confused about here as there, there's talk of, of a metal image and a carved image and a household idol, is thinking what's happening here is a forsaking of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. But that's not actually what's happening. Micah and his mother are invoking the name of Yahweh. They are seeking to worship Yahweh. But by means that Yahweh has not appointed. Which means it's not a first commandment issue, it's a second commandment issue. The second commandment says you shall not make any graven images. God had emphasized to his people obedience to his word. There were particular sacrifices, particular ordinances that God had given to his people, which they must keep and obey. And worship by means of images was strictly forbidden by, by God. Now this is hard for us to recognize because we, we don't necessarily have, you know, stone idols. But our idols are maybe less tangible, less identifiable, but no less pervasive. And, and the culture in which they found themselves, as they move into the promised land, they are surrounded by people whose entire religious expression was not written down. It was communicated by means of statuaries by idols, by visible representations of their religion. So this was, this was just seemed really strange and foreign to the sensibilities of the Jewish people to have a God who says, your faith in me is not going to be based on images. It's going to be based on my word. My word which is objective, it's clear, and that word can be transmitted and passed down in full without error to the generations that follow. An image is always subject to interpretation. Listen to what God says. This is in Exodus chapter 20. This is the, the, the second commandment, the first and second. God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. See, the second commandment remains in full effect, doesn't it? That hasn't gone away in Christ. We, we do not have the liberty to worship God by whatever means that we choose, including images but it also includes any other means that God has not given to us. We decided we really want to worship this way. This was one of the central issues in the Reformation. The Reformers came along and began to read the Word of God. Novel concept, isn't it? And, and what, they, what they found is that the church in Rome had taken to itself a kingly function, a prophetical function, a priestly function that... In, that that belonged only to one, and that was to Christ, revealed through his word. And so they began to look at the, the scriptures and see what the church at Rome has bound the consciences of worshipers to do all manner of things in worship that are not commanded in the word of God. And this is why we can confess with, with full sincerity in our confession, the Pope is that antichrist, that son of perdition. Why? Because he exalts himself instead of Christ as the king, as the prophet and the priest of the church. And even has to take into himself the authority to command people, this is how you are to worship. 
And God says very clearly, no, that is my prerogative alone to instruct on what manner, by what means, I am to be worshipped. The second commandment regulates not who is to be worshipped, but how the true God is to be worshipped. In the Sermon on the Mount, you, you know the, the, the repeated refrain that Jesus makes in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said, but I say to you. So, for example, he dealt with the sixth commandment. You have heard that it was said, do not murder. But I say to you, if you have anger in your heart against your brother, you are guilty of breaking the sixth commandment. If you have lust in your heart, you are guilty of breaking the seventh commandment. Well, in, in a similar manner, all of the commandments are, are, were originally, by God, intended to be expounded beyond just the strict letter. It was more than just murder that was condemned in the Sixth Commandment. It was all unrighteous anger and threats of violence. So, too, in the Second Commandment. Listen to the, the Westminster Larger Catechism. It's, it's a help, helpful for us to ponder what, what is included here in the Second Commandment. Beyond just making a picture of God or a statue of God, what else is prohibited when God says you shall not make a graven image? So the question is, what are the duties required in the second commandment? Listen to the answer. The duties required in the second commandment are the receiving, observing, and keeping pure and entire all such religious worship and ordinances as God has instituted in his word. Now, as we were going to work through the rest of chapter 17 and then in the rest of the book of, of Judges, you're going to see the people did not do this, did they? The, the answer in the catechism question goes on. What are the duties required in the second commandment? The reading, preaching, and hearing of the word, the administration and receiving of the, the ordinances or the sacraments, church government and discipline, the ministry and maintenance thereof, religious fasting, swearing by the name of God alone and vowing unto him, as also the disapproving, detesting, opposing all false worship, and, according to each one's place and calling, removing it, and all monuments of idolatry. Now, under the New Covenant, of course, God has changed the elements of worship. Who brought a goat today? Or a bull? I didn't. We, 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 the elements of worship have changed. But the fact that God sovereignly decrees how he is to be worshipped has not changed. Under the new covenant, we have new ordinances. We will observe the Lord's Supper according to Christ's command. Upon profession of faith, we will observe the ordinance of baptism. Week by week, we, we observe the ordinance of preaching, of prayer, singing hymns and psalms and spiritual songs together, confessing our faith, those things that we believe from the Scriptures. God has not abandoned his absolute sovereign rule. He is worshipped by his own design, not by yours or mine. If at any point, as your pastor, I come and say, we're going we're to introduce something new into worship today, and you don't find it in the pages of Scripture commanded explicitly, then you ought to say to me, Pastor, we're not doing that. We're, you, you have no authority to command us to worship in that way, and you would be absolutely right. That would be your responsibility as a church member to say, that's not right. This is beyond the scriptures. I would, I would, I would recommend to you, and for the sake of time, I won't read it, but in our, our confession of faith, in chapter 22, it's entitled, Of Religious Worship and the Sabbath Day. Look, look very carefully at chapter, chapter 22, paragraph 1. It describes this, this very fact that God alone dictates and defines what true worship looks like. Then in paragraph 5, there's actually a, a, an articulation of the particular elements that are to be used in worship. And I've already named them. It's the proclamation of the word, the reading of the word, singing, confessing together, the ordinance of the Lord's Supper and baptism, lawful oaths and vows, when those are appropriate. Those are the elements of worship. We, we don't have the, the right or the liberty to do away with those, or to add to them. And what we're going to find throughout the rest of the book of Judges is the real danger that comes when a people neglects this. When a people takes it upon themselves as we will worship however we please. We will worship according to what's convenient for us. 
what's comfortable for us, what appeals to our, our flesh or appeals to our, our desires and our wants. When we worship in these ways, as opposed to what God has said, there are inevitable consequences because we become like that which we worship. We become like the idols that we worship, or we become more and more like the person, Yahweh, that we worship. Thirdly, and briefly, not only do we see a disregard for holiness in the law of God, not only do we see a disregard for the means of worship, but we see a disregard of the place of worship. We see this with Micah. Micah sets up his own shrine. He takes this image that was commissioned by his mother. He sets it up in his own house, ordains one of his own sons as his priest. And then we're told in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So there was a disregard for God's prescribed place of worship. Notice something. I'm going to read from Deuteronomy chapter 12. And notice how not only Micah's actions, but this Levite's actions directly contradict what God has already commanded his people with respect to where they are to worship. In Deuteronomy 12, these are the statutes and rules that you shall be careful to do in the land that the Lord your God, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess. All the days that you live on the earth, you shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their gods. On the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree, you shall tear down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and burn their ashram with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of that place. You shall not worship the Lord, the, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. But, listen to this, you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. There you shall go, and there you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the contribution that you present, your vow offerings, your freewill offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your households, and all that you undertake in which the Lord your God has blessed you. You shall not do according to all that we are doing here today. Everyone doing whatever is right in his own eyes, for you have not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance that the Lord your God is giving you. See, God said, I will tell you where I'm going to put my name. I'm going to tell you where you are to worship, and you will go to that place. You will not take that place to you. You will go to that place. What is Micah doing? He's setting up a new place of worship. We're going to see t next week where the, the whole tribe of Dan takes up that initiative and establishes a new place of worship, not in Shiloh, which is where God had chosen, but according to their own designs. Then also look, this Levite, we find him. He is sojourning. He is a man of Bethlehem in Judah of the family of Judah, and a Levite. Now, according to God's law, according to the division of the tribes, the Levites were not given land. They were to be dependent upon the other tribes for their livelihoods, for their sustenance. But they were to reside in Judah, in Bethlehem, and ultimately in Jerusalem. That would be the place of God's worship. They were att to attend to the worship of God in those places. Where's the Levite? going the opposite direction. He's going out to make his own way, to do his own thing, to find a place where he can kind of ply his wares and sort of go this itinerant ministry that was not commanded of the Lord. And see, we see Micah maintains this shrine, this house of gods, and he sits this up in his own, the place of his own choosing. And the next chapter shows us that the whole tribe of Dan took and built upon this same error. Now, under the New Covenant, we have to ask this question. Is this applicable to us? Is there a place of worship in the New Covenant? It's a little bit of a trick question. The answer is yes and no. 
The answer is both yes and no. No, it's, it's, the answer is no, not in the same way. God had appointed one place. He established it as holy ground, appointed a holy building or a holy tabernacle, and said, that is the place of my worship. Under the new covenant, no specific ground, no specific building is holy. This place, because we meet together as a church, there's nothing magical or mystical about the place. There's, there's nothing particularly enchanting about the place in which we worship. What makes it holy is the presence of God. So we, not, we would not say it's in the same way, and certainly not a one centralized place of worship, but there is still a, in, in a symbolic sense, in a metaphorical sense, there is a place that God has appointed. It's where his church gathers, where his churches, local churches, gather. And I will quote from our confession on this, in this point, same chapter, in chapter 22, but very briefly in, chapter, in paragraph 6, it deals with this issue of place. And the words are, are crafted very carefully and intentionally. And I want you to notice how both the freedom of the people, but also the boundaries of God's commands are at play here. Paragraph 6 says, Neither prayer nor any other part of religious worship is now under the gospel tied unto or made more acceptable by any place in which it is performed or towards which it is directed. So we don't worry about our church facing a particular direction, for example. You know, I was reading recently that... that um, you know, in the Masonic uh, Masons cult, their, their lodges are oriented a certain east-west direction for this very reason. It's the idea of place, that there's a, there's a, there's a certain prominence or, or holiness to a place. We reject that entirely. There's nothing about which direction we pray toward or where we pray or where we worship that is important. If in the providence of God, next week we have to meet in an entirely different place, our worship will not suffer at all. But God is to be worshipped everywhere in spirit and in truth, as in private families daily and in secret, each one by himself, so more solemnly in the public assemblies, which are not carelessly nor willfully to be neglected or forsaken when God by his word or providence calls thereunto. So what is the place of our worship? Part of the answer is everywhere. And yet, there is a particularity in that as well. In our homes, around our dinner tables, in our living rooms, as we get up in the morning, walk along the way, as we lay down at night, are we teaching and instructing and admonishing one another in these very things in our homes? Man, I hope that you're doing this. I hope you're, I hope you're opening the scriptures with your families, reading the word of God together, praying together, worshiping God together and in a more solemn way in a public assembly. It, it, it would be insufficient for us as Christians to say, oh, I'm going, I'm, going to, I'm going to have my own private devotions, I'm going to have my family worship, I've done church. No, there still is a, a place, not again in the old covenant sense, of one particular temple or one particular tabernacle, but there is a place in the sense of where God has commanded his people, where God in his province has assembled a congregation, and you're a member of it, that's the place where you ought to be. And to, and to worship in other ways, I can worship just as well in the deer stand. No, you cannot. I can, worship just, I can worship just as well at a family reunion. No, you cannot. There is a place that God has assigned to you. I can worship just as well at, at whatever you fill in the blank of your hobby of choice. No, you cannot. There is a place in that respect that God has assigned. Why is all this important to note here in Judges 7? Why, why does the word of God confront the Israelites on their rebellion against God's revealed patterns of worship? And the answer is because Israelites need to understand, and we need to understand, that the problems they were facing were not ultimately political or economic or military or even social. The spiritual rot and decay in Israel was not found only at the top. It was in the very roots of the hearts of God's people. And it started in this area of worship. 
the rot and decay was found in every average Jewish home, right in the very heart of Israel. This was an every man problem, not only a leadership problem. And the rot began with a lack of true worship of Yahweh. Brothers and sisters, don't, don't we need to be reminded of this? I mean, particularly, as, as you know, most of us have watched the news over the last week and looked at election results and all these kinds of things, and are we tempted to think, wow, there sure is a lot of rot and decay at the top. And there is. That's a true statement. But are we willing to look in our own homes, in our own hearts, and say, is my worship genuine? Am I worshiping by my own means? Am I designing my own paradigm and pattern of worship, or am I worshiping according to how, what Yahweh has commanded? I, am I seeking to conform myself to my king, or am I seeking to go get my king and bring him to me and say, you will serve me? All these statements may be, may be true. We could say our leaders have failed us. That's a true statement. We could say our public institutions have failed us. That would be a true statement. We could say our government has failed us. That's a true statement. We could even say our church has failed us. That's probably a true statement too. But the inescapable lesson from Judges 17 is that every individual bears responsibility for his own apostasy. Every individual bears responsibility for her own straying away from the worship that Yahweh had intended Every man is responsible for his own carelessness in the worship of God. Every woman is responsible for her own waywardness in devotion to Yahweh. It's important for us not only to observe the anatomy of self-derived worship. That's, the first point is the longer one by far today. But what does this self-derived worship look like? We need to understand that. But we also need to understand something about the, the deceptive nature of it. There's a deceptiveness, a self-deception that's sort of built in to this anatomy, to the DNA of our self-deceived, self-oriented, self-derived worshiper. So we'll consider that here next, the self-deception of self-derived worship. Another mouthful, isn't it? If we observe the text carefully, we're going to find that the characters in chapter 17 and 18 actually think that they are honoring Yahweh. They actually believe this. If you, if you had stopped Micah, you know, met him down at, at, at the, the local well and sitting around waiting on water to be drawn and just talking to him about, how's your walk with the Lord? He said, man, you have no idea. The Lord has blessed me. I'm growing. I mean, I've got this new Levite I've taken into my home. I mean, I'm paying him. And man, the Lord's really going to bless this. And I'm not speculating. It's what he says. I mean, I've, I've kind of added to some, some flavor to the scenario, but, but he says, now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as a priest. Is that true? The answer is no. Micah is self-deceived in his self-derived wisdom or re- religion. Micah and his mother and even this Levite have not only contrived their own means and places of worship, but they've actually deceived themselves in thinking that God is pleased with it and that the Lord's blessing will result or will will be found upon them because of their false worship. See the power of self-deception? See how sin deceives us? Now, how can we know that God is displeased with this? I mean... One of the things that's hard sometimes in narrative passages of Scripture to interpret is sometimes we're just told what happened with no judgment at all. You read through the text in chapter 17 as we read it just a little while ago. Nowhere does God say, Micah was wrong. Nowhere does the narrator tell us that Micah's mother was in sin. Nowhere does it tell us that the Levite was in error. So how do we know? Well, we move away from the means of sort of self-evaluation that Micah used. He looked at his own prosperity and thought, God must be blessing this. I'm prosperous. 
God must be blessing this because, you know, there's been a restoration with my mom after me stealing from her. Things are going well. God must really be in this. And don't we think this way sometimes? And the contrary, we also think if, if things are not going well, if we're having a, a, a difficult providence, if we're having a going through a trial, we think God's not in this. Well, how do we know that? See, we, we, we've, we've exchanged the objective word of God for a subjective experience, haven't we? But what happens here? How do we know that God is not blessing this? How do we know that God is not pleased? Well, first of all, there are some internal clues within the chapter itself that suggests that all is not well after all. I'm just going to go through this quickly, but the first clue is a subtle one. In fact, in our English Bibles, it, it's obscured completely. But it, in, in the Hebrew, it becomes out, it's much more clearer. Micah's name is a clue. See, in verses 1 and 4, we're, we're given Mike, Micah's full name, which is Micah Yahu. You hear the, the word Yahu or Yahweh in it? It means, who is like Yahweh? In verses 1 and 4, we have that name. But from there on, it's a shortened form, and Yahweh is removed from his name. It's just Micah. So even the narrator's communicating to us. Micah's name didn't literally change, but the narrator's communicating something pretty powerful to us. There was a point at which God was no longer with him. It's kind of what we saw with Samson. Samson did not know that Yahweh had left him. The Spirit had left him. And here, Micah's name even signifies. Yahweh's not part of this. That's striking, isn't it? The second clue is that there's some technical words used in verses 3 and 4 that describe this metal, this carved image and metal image. And they are exactly the same words, they're technical words, that Moses uses in Deuteronomy 27 when the people of God are forbidden from making these very things. So these aren't just general concepts that are communicated. They were very specific words, and those very specific technical words were used in Deuteronomy to prohibit the very thing that Micah and his mother have conspired to do. The Levites shall declare to all the men of Israel in a loud voice, Cursed be the man who makes a carved or cast metal image an abomination to the Lord. Now, this is an interesting passage because the, the scene is the Moses and the Levitical priests are going to, once they move into the promised land, they're being told that we're going to rehearse this. It's almost like a catechism question. When you, when you cross the land, gather them together, Moses and the priests will say to Israel, keep silent and hear. This day you have become the people of the Lord your God. You shall therefore obey the voice of the Lord your God, keeping his commandments and his statutes. The Levites shall declare to the men in a loud voice, Cursed be the man who makes a carved or cast metal image, an abomination to the Lord. So we already have an infallible interpretation of the events recorded for us in Judges 17. We don't have to rely upon Micah's subjective, experiential interpretation of the events. We have the clear, unambiguous command of God, don't do that. Micah said, I'm doing that, and the Lord's going to bless it. That doesn't, that's not how God works. So the very first curse, and it's the very first curse that the people of God are supposed to hear and kind of rehearse in this public, out loud sort of way, is that anyone who made a carved image and a metal image is to be cursed. Now, interestingly enough, you know what the very the second curse was? If you read further in that same passage, cursed be anyone who dishonors his father or mother. Micah's done both, hasn't he? There's a third clue that Micah and his mother and his Levite are not under God's blessing, and that's the the... Verse 6, in those days, as the, the narrator here is, is telling us about what's happened, and they've got the carved image, they've got the metal image, he's made an ephod out of this. And we're told in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. He's not making an excuse for Micah. He's not saying, well, he didn't know any better. 
No, he had the word of God. He knew. But there was no king to enforce it. So there's another clue that Micah is wrong that he is not going to be prospered of the Lord because of this. And fourthly, Levites, the Levites were tasked with instructing the people of God to avoid this very curse. But this Levite comes, and rather than he gets to, to, to Micah's house, and Micah says, hey, come in, I'd like to hire you, and here's what I'm going to do. Let me show you my, my, my whole uh, panorama here of household gods, including this new one that I've just made. Just had, this, was, this is barely even cooled from the, the, the foundry and we're going to worship Yahweh with it. What should the Levitical priest have done in that moment? You need to repent. You need need to tear these down. The Word of God has commanded clearly, we are not to do this. But the Levite doesn't do this. He goes right along with it. So chapter 17 doesn't simply tell the people of Israel what went wrong. Self-derived worship is always... And every time, it's self-deceptive. And yet, somehow, Micah and his mother and the Levite got into their mind, Yahweh's really going to like this. Look at all we're doing for God. One of the marks of great literature sometimes is an author will not just simply tell you what happened, he's going to show it to you. That's what happens in Judges chapter 17. The people of God have already been told these things. Now we have this brought to life in a literal historical event, and we're going to see the consequences that come in chapters 18 to follow. Chapter 17 shows us, and it's quite possible, it's even common for a person or a ministry or even a church to assume it has God's favor because of apparent outward success, when in fact what they're doing is explicitly condemned by God. Del Ralph Davis says, our writer then is no impartial observer, but a hostile critic. He hints at this by the way he uses contrast, depicts characters, maintains distance. He makes his stance even more obvious, if subtly so, by his sustained irony on providence and vicious sarcasm against these images. Literary manner really does feed didactic intent. How he speaks leads us into what he wants to say. Micah is living proof that it is possible to be set on a course of religious faith and or ministry which exudes success in every respect and yet to rest under the curse of God's judgment. That's a profound statement. It is entirely possible to set on a course of religious faith or ministry which exudes success in every respect and yet It's resting under a curse of God. I don't think I have to help you a whole lot to think about application for this. To to think about worship that, that, that entertains us or feeds us and we think, well, God is really in this. I mean, there's a big crowd. There's a whole stadium full of people doing precisely things that God has commanded not to do. Neglecting to do the very things God has commanded that you must do. And for us to say, well, God must be blessing that. Especially if God to say God is, must be blessing something despite his clear commands against that. May the Lord give us uh, discerning eyes and ears to see and to hear these things. But lastly, we're not left in the dark. We're not left without a remedy. There is a remedy for this self-derived worship. We find that in, in verse 6. In those days there was no king in Israel. What's the remedy? There needs to be a king in Israel. There needs to be a covenant keeping king in Israel. The remedy for self-derived worship is is humble submission to a covenant-keeping king. Now, thankfully, saints, we know God has given us such a king. He's given to us the Lord Jesus Christ, his own son. And, and, And we don't know, again, with certainty, the human author of the book of Judges, but we do know with certainty that the divine author surveys, as it were, all that's wrong with Israel. He takes an unflinching look at the depravity, at the wickedness, at the rot and decay in the souls of men and women in Israel. 
and he says, all that's wrong here, he puts his, it's as if God puts his own finger on the problem and says the root of the matter was a problem of worship. The root of the matter was a problem of worship. Israel did not submit to Yahweh as king and as sovereign Lord and worship him according to his own commands. So the remedy for self-derived worship must begin then in, in a humble submission to the absolute sovereign rule of, of God, especially his unchallenged right to dictate how he is to be worshipped. As it turns out, we still need a king. We still need a king, don't we? So I put the question before you, do you have such a king? Do you have one who rules and governs you, to whom you submit, even in the areas of worship? Perhaps there's, there's something that you would prefer to do in worship that God has not commanded. Will you submit yourself to that? Do you have one reality in your life that governs everything in your life? I mean, besides you. Because all of us, have a king, but it's a or queen, but it's a king or queen that needs to be dethroned and needs to be replaced by a legitimate king. Jesus told his disciples, "No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other." Now he's talking here about the in the in the particular context. You can't worship God and money, but the principle holds in any event. You cannot honor Christ as king while you yourself are still king. Doesn't work, does it? Which king will you follow? King Jesus or king you? God has exalted Jesus, the eternal man, as king over all. That's Paul's message in, in Philippians 2. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now it's hard for us, especially as, as Americans and maybe even particularly as Texans, to, to really get on board with the idea of a monarchy. That, that just sort of in our blood contrary to the, to the idea of a monarchy. It's hard for us to imagine the benefits of a truly righteous king, a true sovereign, a true benevolent Lord. But our Lord Jesus is a good king. He is a benevolent king. He, he, he is a king who certainly will take vengeance upon his enemies. There's no question about that. But he's a gracious king. He's a kind king. He's a gentle king to those who submit to him by faith. I was struck this morning in our, our Sunday school lesson, we were looking at three hymns recorded in, in the first two chapters of, of Luke's gospel. Mary's hymn, in, in, or a hymn of praise in response to the angel Gabriel telling her that she would be the mother of the Christ. And then we have Zechariah. And Zechariah He's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he prophesies. This is in Luke chapter 1. He says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Now that's kingly language. He's celebrating that God has given to us a king. Now listen to what he says about this king. As he spoke by the mouth of, this ho of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. In holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our god whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high 
to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Behold the king that God has raised up, exalted to his own right hand, given a name above every name, that upon the hearing of that name, every knee will bow and every tongue one day will confess that Jesus, in fact, is Lord and King. He is a king who forgives sin. He is a king who shows tender. One means of escaping his wrath that is justly due to sin. The command comes to every man, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God through and only through the Lord Jesus Christ. Submit yourself by faith to him. And believe that his promise of rescue and preservation is really true. Believe that he really is a good and gracious king who will heal you, who will show you tender mercy. And I can guarantee you, on the authority of Scripture, I can guarantee you that if you believe in him, you will be saved. You will be rescued. You will be reconciled to God through him. This is our king. We need to, we need to learn from Judges chapter 17, that there is a cost. There is a cost to a self-derived worship, a self-centered worship, a man-centered worship. It, it is not indifferent to God, and it ought not be indifferent to us. There is a cost to it. There is a self-deception that goes with that. We, we, we can delude ourselves into thinking God is in something when God is not in it, because he's not commanded it. We, we need to train our eyes not to look outwardly as the world does and see apparent success, see crowds and bank accounts full and, and all these kinds of things and think, well, God must be blessing those things if those things are in direct contradiction to his word. We ought to seek the only remedy, the only remedy for this self-derived worship is to humble ourselves, submit our will to his beginning with how we worship and extending to all of our lives. How do we walk before the Lord? By faith. Let's pray together. God, our Father, we rejoice at the mercy that you've shown to us. We rejoice that in the fullness of time you sent your own son born of a woman, born under the law, who lived perfect, sinless, righteous life, and ultimately to bear the curse that was rightly due to us. Your word declares, cursed is every man who violates the second commandment, who worships you in a way that we ought not. Cursed is every man who dishonors father and mother. And the curses go on and on and on, and, and Christ has taken them all for us. We give you thanks, we praise you, Father, that you have, in your Son, made a way for your own wrath against sinful men and women to be quenched, to be fulfilled, to be poured out upon the perfect, sinless, spotless, once-for-all sacrifice. We pray that you will give us ears to hear today. Give us hearts that believe. Give us the power of your spirit to hold fast to these promises. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.